Okay, another edition of the Edlo Podcast, and we are here with one of the few people who make me feel small in the world, Paul Isadora. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Uh, excited. I've obviously heard uh, a lot of your your uh, podcasts. Uh, I guess I've listened to mostly wrestling ones. I don't know if I've listened to many of the other ones. Obviously, I think it's, I don't know if that's how everybody else is, but kind of like pick and choose. Like, hey, I think I'll be interested in listening to what this person has to say. So, um, yeah, so haven't uh, haven't del- uh, dove into a whole lot, but uh, wrestling ones for sure. Yeah, well, that's the way I think that mine's set up is, you know, not everything is going to hit everywhere, but I'm interested in talking to everybody, and then uh, people can pick and choose what they like. We've had uh, I've had a lot of really cool ones. Oh, look at this. My emails are just, like, kicking out. Hold on, i got to get that out of here. I've been uh, – it's crazy, man. I'm getting ready for trial and, and stuff like that is just so crazy. Um, but anyhow, so, uh, yeah, I met you a long time ago. And like I said, I mean, I mean, it was probably, what, 2009, 2010? Right. So I think it was probably when you were getting ready to start running shows, right? Something yeah. Like- yeah, you and Lester and, uh, and all the Reno, kind of the Reno scum and Choopy kind of got everybody involved. And you were one of those guys, just like, just like the scum and just like Choopy, that I was like, I, I want these guys on my shows. And um, right, right. You, and um, tell me, well, first let's let's go back and talk a little bit. Where did you grow up? So I'm I'm from San Jose, California. So um, <laughs> obviously, just not too far from from where you're from, I guess. But um, yeah, San Jose, California. So born in Fremont, uh, mm. and we moved to San Jose. So. And then I think I lived there from probably like age three to all the way through junior college. Mm. Uh, so same house the whole time. So just, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, had, I don't know. I just, I think I have a good, you know, good upbringing. Parents tried to probably do what all parents try to do and, you know, make their uh, kids life better than theirs. So and I think yeah. as, a, as a parent, you know, we probably feel the same way. It's like, I just want to, give my kid a better life than I had. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I I agree. And it's interesting too the cycle of that, because you gotta, you know, you had a good upbringing and you want to make a better life for your kid, but where is the line for that? Right. Because you know, you, you, you spoil them too much and then they, they come out soft. Mm -hmm. I'm running into that right now. I had a, I don't, I wouldn't say, I don't know. I, it it's, I wouldn't say rough upbringing. I mean, it was, it was tough. I had, you know, I, I've shared on here before, you know, I had a, a father who, you know, he's, he, he dealt with some demons and, you know, and all that. And neither one of my parents went to college. Well, they went, but they never graduated. And, uh, and so I wanted to make a better life for them. And I believe I have, but uh, as far as the finances and things like that, but you got to find like a, a good balance between giving them the things you didn't have, but also not getting, making them kind of entitled, you know, have you noticed that yourself? Oh, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, we, um, I know I, I remember my parents like vividly telling me about a, uh, a Christmas where they were like on the verge of bankruptcy and like, mm. um, you know, if, if it's between buying him every gift on the, on the list and, and going bankrupt, you know, let's just get it over with and, um, you know, have a great Christmas and, you know, we'll kind of deal with uh, that after the fact, um, you know, never, never filing for bankruptcy, but that was the mentality, you know, like mm. um, kind of, we're going to kind of scrap everything we can together to, you know, to uh, uh, maybe hide the fact that we're in, um, you know, a bad way financially and, um, you know, and I think my, my parents kind of were in a, maybe a situation where maybe some jobs that dead end jobs, like far away, they both worked in like San Mateo, uh, San Francisco area. So, you know, a 45 minute or 45 mile commute w- you know, with traffic and, uh, just make for long days. And, um, but then they end up getting into the real estate business. Like my dad, uh, uh, older in life, went to college. He's, he was in the Navy, so went to the call. You know, went to college for free with the GI Bill or whatever uh, the terminology was for it at that point. And 
um, you know, graduated college, you know, I think maybe close to 40. I'm not sure exactly, but um, yeah. So just trying to, you know, trying to make a better life. I mean, he was the first one in our family to, uh, to go to college and then obviously graduated as well. So, um, you know, kind of set the bar for me as far as that was concerned. Uh, wow. So that was kind of the goal. Yeah. Wow. So now are you an only child? Do you have uh, brothers and sisters? Yep. I'm an only child. So, um, yeah, my, my parents, um, were married for 11 years, um, trying to have children and, uh, just, just wasn't, you know, wasn't happening. So they're on that, on the verge, like, you know, well, we want to have a family, so maybe we'll just adopt and then ended up getting pregnant. So, um, yeah, so just, um, you know, so they were early thirties when, when I was born, oh, um, nice. you know, and I guess in, in some circles, you'd say that, you know, you have those, those parents that do that, right. They want to get their career off the ground. They want to get that established. Um, and then they're going to have children later in life. Um, and then obviously the opposite side of the spectrum, you have those people that are, um, you know, have kids early and then kids are out of the house when they're 40. So, yeah, yeah. I know when, <clears throat> when I decided to have a kids, I always wanted to have them younger just because my, uh, my grandfather was a really cool. <laughs> I was really close to him, but, he kind of similar to your parents, him and my grandmother had a really hard time having kids. So they were closer. I think they were in their mid thirties, maybe even closer to forties when my mom and my aunt were born. And, um, and so I just remember my grandparents were always old. You know what I mean? Uh, they just not super active. I was the oldest of the, of the kids. So I got a little bit of it, but I think my grandpa was maybe 60 ish 65 when I was born oh, wow. and and so he was a little older and so I just remember thinking to myself I want to be a young dad so that that way I could play with my kids still play basketball with them and then if maybe even do that with my grandkids you know and that's so I started having them in my mid-20s mm -hmm. and uh and that I think that worked out for me do you think uh do you ever wish as an only child that you would have had brothers and sisters Oh, all the time. And it's, it's crazy because these are conversations. So I've got five daughters and these are conversations that I have with them all the time. Like, you know, I can't believe you guys are fighting because, you know, <laughs> you have, you know, a friend that lives next, you know, in the next room over, like I, I would have, uh, you know, I would have died for that. And I, I was always like, man, just, you know, you're having to use your imagination to, to think of things to do because, you know, you're in your room by yourself and it's just like, you know, what game am I going to, you know, figure out and put together or, um, you know, because, you know, maybe your friends aren't home or whatever. Um, so you're just kind of left to, to your own devices and uh, try to figure things out on your own. So I'm just, I'm always just amazed, like, you know, what's going on? Like you, ha you have this person that's your friend and, uh, but for some reason, you guys can't get along, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do that with my kids all the time. They seem like they're always fighting, especially the girls. The girls are just, it was funny. My girls went and uh, spent a week with their mom camping. And uh, and so it was just me and the boys. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because we went to my mom's house. And my mom was like, so do you miss your sisters? And they're both like, no. <laughs> they're like, no. They're like, it's been so quiet. It's been nice nobody's fighting there's no drama we just like we eat pizza we watch movies it's great <laughs> you know and so yeah, exactly. there yeah so five girls man there's a lot of estrogen going on in your place. right yeah <laughs> so, so a lot, so, a lot so, of cooking as well though you know cooking yeah. and uh just i don't know i can uh i can parent from a a, a teenage boy's perspective so i kind of give them the <laughs> the you know the insight on like hey you know maybe this guy's giving you attention for the wrong reason yeah uh, so yeah oh man so how, what are the ages of your girls um one is gonna be 21 this year then there's one that's 18 13 10 and 4 so wow spread out quite a bit as well you know that's funny my parent my parents spread us out too there's four of us so I, I, there's me, my brother's five years younger than me. My next 
uh, my sister's 10 years younger than me and then my other sister's 21 years younger than me. So we're oh, just wow. all spread out like that. And uh, um, w- w- was the, were the last couple, were you trying to get a boy or was it just, did they come well, on accident? We, we, we never found out the gender uh, of any of the babies. You know, it was always just like, you know, you pray for um, a healthy child, right? And it was just um, our original thought, like when we got married was that we wanted to have three children. So, um, you know, we had the first two, obviously fairly close together. Um, and then the next one, a little bit further out. And then it was almost like, okay, so now the older two are kind of buddy, buddy, and they kind of ignore the younger one. So like, well, what if we just have one more and then it'll be like two sets of companions. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at some point it was just kind of like, you felt like something was missing. So, um, we're like, you know, why don't we just, we'll try one more time and, um you know and then you know it felt like uh like life was complete at that point so um yeah and ironically i was talking to somebody else and they're like you know what man exact same thing happened in my family like you just felt like there's a there's a hole and then now that uh, that void is full so um that's kind of how it was for us no that's exactly the way it was yeah i mean uh i i I remember when my fourth came, when Lincoln came, I remember being like, that's it. We're good. You know, right. and that, that was it. And so it's, it's funny how that works out. It's almost an innate, you know, you have it in your, in, you just have an instinct for it. So right. it's interesting. Now going back to your childhood. So I, so I'm six, seven, I'm the biggest person in my family by a long shot. Okay. Uh, is that the way it is for you too? Or was your parent, were your parents also really tall? No, you know, my dad was like, uh, about maybe six, three, my mom was probably five, eight. So maybe, you know, you would consider that a tall person, um, you know, for an average person. But for me, it was like, you know, I was the same size as my dad as probably maybe a freshman or sophomore in high school. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know. I mean, I think my dad said he had a, maybe an uncle that was six, seven or something like that. But besides that, I mean, all my, uh, my uncles, my dad's brothers were, you know, that six foot range, five, 10, things like that. Uh, but you know, big, thicker guys. So, uh, hmm. I don't know. So maybe I got like a little bit of that, you know, adult thickness, but somehow continue to grow. I don't know. Yeah. Why well, that's it. A- that's the thing also that I've no, I noticed about you and I kind of related to you was that you're tall, but you're also not like, there's a lot of tall, skinny guys out there. Right. But like, you know, I was always, I was always the tallest guy in my class, but I was also big. I just was always big. Right. And you just kind of struck me as the same type. Were you always the kind of the biggest guy in your class? No, you know, actually I graduated high school, probably six, seven, um, 165 probably something like that really so, yeah i mean you'd, you'd have to like maybe take a look at some of the pictures on my facebook or something and you'll just see like i'm just this like bean pole um <laughs> but i don't know always kind of had a bit of athleticism um but yeah just i i constantly tell people about like so my daughter's 13 she just started playing basketball um, and I feel like she's going through the same type of cycle that I did. And I feel like when I was 10 years old, I was pretty well coordinated with um, athletic ability versus height. Um, mm-hmm. And then that probably didn't happen again until maybe 18 or so, 19. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another spurt like that until you know, I was like 6'7 to 6'10. And then then I felt like everything kind of fell back into place where mm. I was kind of used to my body. Um, and my daughter's going through the same thing. So she's 13 and she's 5'10". Um, mm. Wow. So, um, you know, so it's just, I'm, I'm just seeing the same pattern that I went through. And I remember just being so frustrated, like never making an all-star team and, yeah. uh, you know, thinking, like, oh, I'm a good, I'm a good player, you know, thinking to myself, like, uh, you know, why am I not making the all-stars? But 
looking back and I've you know talked to some of my friends about um you know my daughter and they're like hey you were exactly like that man that sounds exactly like your story so, yeah um so yeah I mean I didn't I feel like I didn't put on like the um maybe grown man muscle until maybe even after college I, I feel like I played in college at like 225 235 something like that and then when I started playing overseas is when I finally got to like 250 or 265. Um, so, you know, when I was in, you know, early to mid 20s, I think wow. it's like, like I, I always describe it as getting like your grown man muscles or your grown man strength. Yeah. So that's it's funny you bring that up because, yeah, I feel the same way. Like I, I was just really uncoordinated. I mean, I grew, I grew fast. So I, I was in sixth grade, I was six foot tall. Oh, wow. And then, and then when I got to freshman year, I was six five, two sixty. Oh, wow. So, so I mean, I was I was big, and I mean, I they everybody wanted me for every sport. You know what right. I mean? It's just because I was just so gigantic. They wanted me for but football, basketball, baseball, shot put, like everything. Right. And I and I played basketball, and so you know we played with Matt Barnes, who was a year ahead of me, and all that. Right. So we had a good time, but like. Um, but I remember those years, seventh, eighth grade, freshman year, trying to kind of figure it out. I think I kind of started figuring out because uh, I was a little I was pretty doughy. I had some baby fat most of the time until I got to be about a junior and I trimmed down. And uh, and then that's when I really grew into my body and was able to play. And then that's when I started kind of div divvying into the wrestling. Sounds like you had a similar things just a little bit later. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, um, and I was truly I was a baseball guy from age eight to 18, I think. Hmm. Um, and then my junior year of high school, um, I, you know, tried out for basketball and got cut. And then <laughs> they asked me to play that summer. So I played with them in the summer league um, and then made the team as a senior. Um, and ironically, my freshman year, I was probably 6'2", and my math teacher was the basketball coach, but never mm. once did he try to uh, persuade me into playing basketball, which I just <laughs> think like from a basketball coach's mindset, it's like, I feel like you notice every tall person on your campus and go, hey, uh, why don't you come out and play basketball with us? Oh, they yeah, they, they were just, all over me. As soon as I walked in, they were all over me. Right. Yeah, they wanted me to play everything. And, and uh and I just, like I said, the, my dad was a basketball guy. I actually, I went to summer, the summer before my freshman year, I went to the first f football practice. You know, they had summer practices. And the basketball team was playing. And so my dad was waiting to pick me up, and he went over to the basketball uh, coach, and the coach was just came out and asked him who your son is, and he pointed to me. And he waved him over, and he, he waved me over, and I said, he goes, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm playing football. And he goes, well, why don't you quit that crap and come play basketball? And I was like, uh, well, I mean, I do like basketball. You know, that is my number one sport. Right. And he and he said, uh, he goes, well, we got Matt Barnes and we go to all these places and he'll be a senior when you're a junior. Why don't you come out and play summer league with us and see if you like it? So that's what I did. And then, you know, yeah, he so that my dad pushed me that way. And I think it was a good move. You know, um, because football, and now we're hearing all this more stuff about head injuries and things of that nature. Probably a good thing. I probably would have gotten stuck on an O line or a D line somewhere, and of course. you know. And so, so, um, so when did you? Tell, you ended up playing for University of Nevada Reno, right? Yep. Yep. And then you ended up going overseas. So tell me how that progression happened. Well, so I mean, it was one of those things. So, I, like I told you, my dad was in the Navy, so. Uh, graduated from high school and it was like, all right, so you got two options. You're either going to go to the military or you're going to go to college. And I just didn't think um, I was tough enough to go into the military. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go to this junior college, which was San Jose City College. Um, and uh, it just so happened that they were uh, like perennial, um, you know, final four in California junior college. Um, really? so, so it just so happened I go there and I'm, you know, I'm competing with these guys and it's like probably our team was like nine black dudes and three white dudes. Um, so I, I just got beat up, like physically uh, abused 
by these much more talented, um, much more confident um, other players, you know. So, um, and uh, you know, I just got better and better. So, um, you know, came from being in high school on a really bad high school team, poorly coached, uh, to go into this coach, and his name's Percy Carr. Um, and I believe he's the winningest coach in California junior college history. Um, mm. So I think he was, you know, he was a decade or two in when I got there and I graduated in 93. Um, and I think he coached decades after that. So, um, but it was just like a military type uh, coaching mentality. It was just like, you know, you're, you expect perfection and, and you look back and it's like, you know, from a coaching mindset, it's probably like he saw something in me that it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you need to achieve um, this level um, of success. You know, this is what your potential is. So I'm going to get every drop of potential out of you. So um, I basically gray shirted my first year there um, and then, you know, played the next two years um, and, you know, probably had maybe a, a dozen scholarship offers. Um, I ended up actually signing with UC Santa Barbara um, and then uh, kind of got a, a, a taste of reality about uh, politics and coaching. The coach that was uh, recruiting me uh, got fired and then uh, mysteriously, I didn't qualify academically to go to that school. So hmm. I was in like mad dash mode um, Santa Barbara's on a quarter system um, versus um, semester systems with a lot of other colleges. So, you know, they were a few months out, but other colleges were, you know, like six weeks out. So it's like, mm. now I got six weeks to find another place to play. So, you know, now I'm calling all the coaches that have offered me a scholarship and saying, hey, uh, do you still have a scholarship available? And Nevada was the place that was like, I was still in a scholarship. So, my mom and I came up to Reno, um, you know, had dinner with the coach, um, met some of the team, and then I was like, I, you know, it feels right. So, um, you know, I signed my letter of intent and came to Nevada. Man, so uh, that's interesting. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what you feel, because I feel like the way I was coached in basketball, particularly in high school, really – really had an effect on me in a positive way. And it was very, it was very similar to what you were saying from your coach in junior college. I mean, they were like on you. I mean, just ripping you up. They were not nice. Right. Uh, you know, you were running all day. I can remember, I can remember one game we had, we got, I mean, demolished. It was like one of those things where you just, for whatever reason, you just not on, you know, and, it was not a better team. That was the thing that was frustrating. They were a worse team. And we just got smoked at home. Right. And I remember I remember being in the, the locker room after the game and coach would just come in and you know, if we had a, if we had a good week, you know, he'd give us Saturday off or whatever, you know. He comes in and he goes, uh, practice tomorrow, seven AM, bring your running shoes. And <laughs> we ran for two hours straight. I thought I was gonna die. I mean, that was the way it was. And now I fast forward, my son played basketball and is planning on playing this year. We'll see. Conditioning's coming up. We'll see. He right. seems like he's, he, see, he seems like he's actually, I got to hand it to him. I've never seen him so poised. I mean, he's working out, he's running. He gets up in the morning and runs. I mean, I'm really impressed. He's actually really serious about it. But, um, but I, he went and, and, you know, I go to the dinner at the end of the year or whatever. And the coach is just like, you know, he goes, my team last year, we won the whole thing, but everybody was really angry and sportsmanship wasn't that great. And so this year I told my kids, I was like, hey, you know what? Like you knock someone over, pick them up, you know? And I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, he goes, he goes, yeah, if they hit a free throw, you know how you slap hands, go slap their hand. And I was like, what? And so we got in the car and I said, forget everything that guy just said. <laughs> it's like, it was forget all of that. No, let me show you some of the, let me show you some of the bad boys in Detroit. This is how you play basketball. Right. You know right. what I mean? So so tell me, like, do you think that your coaching in junior college did 
did it did it just how did that affect you well i think it was one of those things like um it it tested me mentally i got to the point where um you you realize like the, the mistakes you make don't just affect you they affect everybody on your team um, and a perfect example would be like i make a mistake and everybody runs except for me then all my teammates are like you know giving you the stink eye like <laughs> yeah. don't mess up again you know uh because you know then, then it's going to be trouble right so right. you start you start getting that accountability right you're you're not just playing for yourself you're playing for um the other four guys on the court the other 14 guys on the team you know things like that so um you know, so I think that was a, it was a good lesson for me. And it also showed me like, you know, I am mentally strong. Um, you know, there was, I didn't want to miss anything. Like I had a really bad ankle injury. Um, and I just like, I just did not want to miss practice because I knew like, man, I'm, I'm on a good roll here. I'm playing. Um, and I just didn't want to lose that. Right. So I'm just like, I'm just going to tape up and go, man. Uh, and then it just got kind of that to that point where it's like, hey, man, you're just you're not mobile. You're going to hurt yourself more. Um, so I ended up missing like a couple games. And it was like the biggest deal for me. Like, I'm just like, man, I'm letting my team down. You know, I could really be helping them out there. But, um, you know, the teams I played on went like 30 and five and 27 and seven. So they, they did pretty well, regardless of if I was playing or not. But. Um, but I do remember, like, the first, like, week of practice that we were there, uh, the coach, you know, pulls us all aside and is like, hey, listen, you guys need to understand, like, I understand you probably were the best player on your high school team, but there can only be one best player on this team. So, um, you know, you need to find out what your role is and you need to accept it. Um, you know, and if you're not willing to do that, you know, there's the door. Uh, I'm going to feel the team just as good next year. You know, like hmm. just basically the I don't need you to win speech, you know. Yeah. And, and a lot of guys dropped off, man. It was just – I remember playing against guys in high school that I'm like, these guys are studs. And then next thing you know, it's just they couldn't handle mentally what we were going through. But um, I, I'll always say, like, I, I'll never be coached harder than I got coached at that junior college program. Um so, you know, then after that, it's like any coach is yelling at you. It's like I've, I've heard worse, and mm -hmm. you start to lis listen to the words, not the way it's being said. So uh, I definitely try to preach that to my daughter. Like I said, just started playing basketball not too long ago. Yeah, I, it's funny you bring that. It, 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 we've, I've had the same conversation with my kids because, you know, they, it, they're so – not all of them but like they're kind of sensitive kids these days, you know what I mean? They're real sensitive. And I think that that's part of it. You know what I mean? Like I, I got yelled at so much in, in basketball. You know what I mean? We, we all did. It wasn't just me. I mean, just the whole team, we were constantly being, you know, forced to run, screwing up, yelling at us. Mili like you said, a military type type coaching to the point where like, you know, you, you get, you get a, a boss who's, yelling at you or you get somebody who's you know you get you're dealing with somebody who's a jerk it doesn't it doesn't affect you you know i think that's super important and so so you, you play basketball at, at unr tell me what that was tell me about the jump was there a big jump between playing junior college and playing at unr yeah i mean I, and i was kind of talking about how like I, I felt like you know i was still growing i was still like i felt like my the year that i uh, gray shirted in junior college was one of those years that it just like I wasn't ready to play college basketball mm -hmm. and then it was like another stage like my junior year of college I think during my senior year they were talking about that I had um, in like the first three games I had surpassed the amount of minutes that I played in the entire junior year um, at Nevada so you know it was in like the 40 minute range or 49 minutes that I played the entire season. So um, it was just one of those deals, another kind of learning experience where, um, you know, just things that you think like, oh, I have to have 
a hundred post moves. Um, mm -hmm. You start going, you know, it, it um, just kind of simplify things and go, you know, if I have a couple that I'm really, really comfortable with, that I can go with both hands either way over either shoulder, have a counter to each one of those, um, it becomes a much simpler game. So you're not like worrying about like which which move do I go to or um, things like that. You just try to work on getting really good at doing, you know, eight or ten things rather than mm -hmm. trying to do a hundred things. So uh, and a big thing for me was uh, between my junior and senior year was going to the Pete Newell big man camp in Hawaii. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and that was one of those things I went and there, there was people from all over the country, all these different names. There was Michael Candy that was at uh, Pacific. There was Tim Young from Stanford. Um, just, just a bunch of studs there. Um, I want to say like Darnell Robinson from Arkansas. So just, a bunch of big time guys and then it's like and then you're doing one-on-ones with them and you're like man i'm keeping up i'm you know i'm doing the same thing they do i have a similar skill set like you start going you know the confidence starts you know really um you know really building and then the next thing you know it's like i go into my senior year and i've got this different confidence level you know i'm of the mentality, like if I catch the ball on the post, um, you know, there's really nothing they can do. So, um, unfortunately, I played in a system that was more guard centered, where mm -hmm. my role was more, you know, I'm going to set a screen and get somebody open. I'm going to play good defense. I'm going to dive on the floor and get loose balls. Um, I'm going to defend strongly. Uh, I'm going to block my guy out every time. Like, I'm just going to do all the little things that aren't going to show up on a stat sheet um, and just try to be the best teammate that I could. Yeah. You know, um, that's really, so, you know, I, I had a couple of different things I wanted to ask you about on that. The one thing I thought was really interesting was you, uh, you mentioned the uh, get really good at eight to 10 moves that kind of translates to wrestling quite a bit, Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, it's it's so funny how you hear like you know people are are making fun of the five moves of doom, but it's just like if if you get really good at a, a few things and um, where it's um, the maybe the crowd knows it's coming and they can get behind you, um, you know you don't have to do a ton of things really well. You know, it's not like you and I are going to be uh, chain wrestling uh for for 10 minutes in a match you know um you know a couple of holds and um a couple of counters and you know you can make everything uh kind of go together seamlessly and, and, and really what we're trying to accomplish is is just telling that good story right 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 well you know i heard uh i heard jake the snake roberts once say <laughs> when i first started wrestling i knew a thousand moves and about five years in i knew a hundred now I do three and get over, <laughs> you know? And so um, you mentioned a lot about your confidence level. And, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of people about mindset. Tell me what you think, you know, you, you mentioned that you had a different confidence level and it improved your game. Tell me more about what you think the mental aspect of confidence and how that plays a role in success. Oh, I think it plays a huge role, man. It's like just um... – I don't know. You hear people say like, whether you think you, you can, or you think you can't, you're always right. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. that's the power of the mind. Um, you know, you, you can put yourself up to doing so many different things, just if you have the confidence or the mindset that, that you think you can do those things. Um, yeah. you know, I was just ironically kind of going back to wrestling. I was thinking like, um, our show this Saturday, um, you know, I just did like, mad run to the ring like um to kind of um save adam and luster and i just like people were like you ran so fast like you just like came out of nowhere and just like slid under the bottom rope and then i'm just like man i wonder that's probably the same type of thing it would take to do like a suicide dive and then i'm just like maybe i should start doing a suicide dive you know because it's <laughs> like you know the mindset you're like well if i could do this 
that's no different. You know, you're right. the same visualization, all this stuff. So it's just like, wow, man, I'm, um, I don't know if I'm tricking myself into thinking that I could do that, but it's like, <laughs> it's the things that you think all of a sudden, like, oh, I, I can do that because I can visualize myself doing it. So, um, but it was one of those things like, um, and, and being a confident person, I think that uh, uh, it rubs off on your teammates, it rubs off on uh, locker rooms, you know, whatever situation you're in, you know, colleagues. Um, I think, you know, you, uh, um, you know, you have that type of mindset. When we talked about, uh, I was, I was teaching a leadership class today and I was just like um, talking about that confidence level. We talked about body language and posture and things like that, how that can convey uh, confidence. Even if you're not confident, your posture maybe can convey that and people are like, oh man, this guy has his stuff together. So mm. uh, I think it's, it's really goes back to that, that mindset. So you were teaching a leadership class. What, what do you do for work? Yeah. So I'm a teacher. So I, oh. um, I actually just, it's so crazy because, so I, I finished playing in college in 98 um, and I had 13 units left my senior year. Um, when I got the opportunity to go overseas. So, um, you know, obviously everybody always dreams about playing professional sports. Um, and I think like sometimes we're really small minded as far as thinking like there's nothing outside the United States. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and in 98, there was the lockout, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a lot of people that were borderline NBA guys would go play in the CBA and borderline CBA guys would go play in the IBA. Um, and I got a trial in the IBA and there was like 40 something guys there and they had one roster spot open. Um, mm. So it was just like very difficult that specific year. Um, so I had a, you know, I had an agent that was like, Hey, you know, I have an opportunity for you to go overseas and play. And, um, you know, I was like, well, you know, I want to, I want to take that opportunity. So, um, I got to go play in Bulgaria, Denmark, Australia, and China. Um, and then basically when I got home, it was just very much like, um, you know, life got in the way, you know, you got married, start having kids and, um, you know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm just trying to work a job and make a living and provide and all this stuff. And, uh, the education kind of got put on the back burner. Um, and then you start kind of getting into that when you're applying for jobs and like, do you have a college degree? I'm like, well, I've got, a, you know, 108 units. Uh, <laughs> I, have yeah. degree, but I have 108 units of college, but it's, uh, so when COVID happened, it was just one of those things where I'm like, you know, this is kind of a, the opportunity. I was working from home and I'm like, I'm just going to take some online classes and just try to knock this out. So. Uh, I graduated uh, December of 2021 um, and then started thinking like, well, um, kind of what can I do? Like I, I wanted to be a PE teacher. So I'm like, what can I do with uh, a degree? What what else do I need to do before I can become a teacher? So um, I've been going through that process. And then so I just got a, a job. I, today was my first actual day teaching, but um, I got a PE job at a uh, – um, for middle school here at a school right down the road for me. So I teach middle school, I teach uh, uh, leadership, and then I teach uh, an academic skill center uh, for the athletes at the school. So I can kind of share the same type of uh, things I'm talking to you about right now with these athletes about how important it is to, to get that education, how that uh, correlates with playing in college and things like that, and the things that coaches are going to be looking for and um, you know, how it could be your grades could be that, uh, um, could tip the scales in, in your direction when it comes to a coach recruiting two of a very similar player, you know, one, one person has good grades, one person doesn't, they're always going to take that guy that has the better grades. So, right. Um, wow. So you're, you're a teacher now. That's I'm awesome. A teacher. Yeah. Yeah. So now tell me, um, you're, you got married, you came back. What, how old were you when you came back? Um, I was probably maybe 23, 24, mm. something like that. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I had already, I had met my wife 
my junior year of college. Um, mm -hmm. And so she was kind of on the ride uh, the whole time. And uh, yeah, so and it's kind of crazy. I was just thinking like, as we were talking earlier about, you know, getting, having children late and things like that. And I just remember always when I was, when I was younger thinking, you know, I'm not going to get married till I get like really old, like, like 25 or something like that. You know, <laughs> 25. Yeah. Like perspective when you're, when you're young, you think like, Oh, 25, that's, that's old. Cause you probably be close to retiring at 40. Right. Cause, yes. cause you don't know any better. You just like, yeah. well, cause you'll be really, really old when you're 40. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we got, we got married when I was 25 and, um, you know, just kind of, uh, went from there. Man. So now tell me, uh, you, so you got married when you were 25, where does wrestling come in? Um, wrestling was ironically, I was talking to someone on America online. It was probably, it might've been Adam. It might've been Corey. Um, but I was talking to someone and they were talking about how they had this wrestling school in Reno and that I should come by. And I literally just never got around to going, you know, hmm. um, that was my, it was my senior year of college. And I was just like, you know, I was, I had talked to these people and, um, and then, you know, a number of years later, um, I, I was working with Corey Dayton and hmm. he, uh, he left his company wide email open. So someone as a joke thought they would write a, uh, an email to the whole company saying, uh, advertising maybe on a wrestling show that weekend, uh, they're wrestling in Susanville, California. Um, so I'm sure in an effort to try to embarrass Corey, uh, they did this, but when I read it, I was like, Oh man, I love wrestling, man. I'm going to go check this show out. Um, so I go to this show, uh, and you know, I see luster, I see Malachi, I see Flacco, ugly, choopy, um, just Corey, uh, all these guys, uh, Brian Raymond, um, trying to think of who else is Mustafa. Yeah, this is like, this is like a, this is like a trip down memory lane. Call oh, it's a, and it was like a who's who, man. Like yeah. all these people, you know, it was, <laughs> you know, I want to say Pogo wrestled Malachi, uh, Mustafa wrestled on that show. Uh, Adam, Corey and Luster had a three way, um, just, and I just remember, like, I remember looking at their website before I went to the show and seeing, like, Luster listed at, like, 6'6", six, six, Malachi at 6'5", and I remember I was sitting down when these guys walked past me, and I was thinking, man, these guys are huge, mm -hmm. right? And you think, <laughs> you or I, if we were right. standing up, maybe they don't look that big, but I'm sitting down in a chair, and I already, in my mind, I have this guy 6'6". Six, six. So, you know, he had the double Mohawks at the time and just, you know, look, it was a larger than life um, mm. feeling for me. And I was like, dude, that dude can kick my ass right there. Um, <laughs> you know, and obviously that's what you want, right? You want to have those guys on your show that the fans don't go, oh, I could kick that dude's ass. Right. 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 So, um, and there's yeah. a lot of those out there on the NDC. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of those guys. Right. Yeah. So. I, after the show's over, I talked to Corey and I was like, man, how do I get into this? And he's like, well, the guy that trains us, Brian Brigger is right over there. Just go talk to him. So that show was on a Saturday. And I think I started training the next Saturday. Oh, wow. So, now, uh, your wife was in the picture. Were you married at that point or not? Um, I believe she was. Yeah. So, um, cause I remember like going, Hey, this is going to cost me a thousand dollars to get started. Um, and she was like, all right, this is your dream or, uh, you know, this is our next chapter, whatever you, how you are, however you want to look at it. And, um, so she's like, yeah, let's do it. If you, if you want to do it. So, um, so, you know, I, I paid my money and, um, you know, I'd go train with these guys and, um, it's just crazy. You look at it from a training aspect, like when you're training people. Um, and I always thought like everyone that worked for SPW probably lived in Sacramento. Um, very naive thought, right? It's like, right. And you realize some of these guys are coming from Stockton or San Jose or Fresno or whatever. Right. And it's just like, you don't realize how fortunate it is to have like 
a school in your hometown, but uh, I took full advantage of it, man. I would go there, train on my lunch breaks, and um, I just wanted to get in there as much as possible, you know, because I, um, you know, I think I started at 27, you know, so mm. um, so a little later, but you've talked to a lot of, like, obviously listening to the trip interview, like yeah. how late he started. So, um, yeah, so I don't know, man. It was just – then you just begin this like roller coaster ride where you're just like on the road and listening to all these guys that have more experience than you, but uh, in most cases are younger than you. Yeah. <laughs> well, so have you always been a wrestling fan? Was that always something that was in the cards for you? Oh yeah, man. It's uh, it was. I remember my my parents getting me those nine inch rubber LJN figures. Oh, I had them too. I still have them up, and my kids have them. They're they're beat to shreds, but I oh, got yeah. them all up there. Yeah, they're yeah. working on them now, but it was, I remember I started with the uh, the Hogan Iron Sheik pack. Yeah. Those two wrestles there, and they got me the ring. So, um, yeah, and then it was just like just building the collection after that, man. I had like a, a small garbage can full of those figures, and yeah. we were just like, um, we would just have like, we, we used to videotape, like put the wrestlers in this position. And then put them in this position. Like, <laughs> you know, it was like these stop yeah. frame, you know, of the yeah. wrestling matches. So it was, uh, and then, you know, we, we did the wrestling in my buddy's front yard, you know, just on the grass. And, um, you know, it's it's funny how you think back, like, you know the rules so well. So, you know, it's a, it's a coin flip for who wins this match. And it's like, I've got the belt and I lose the coin flip. And I know if I get disqualified, I get to keep the belt, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's like you're already thinking that mindset at that point uh, of how to uh, keep yourself with the with the strap. Yeah, no kidding. I have to ask you, <clears throat> I don't know if this is like, you, like this for you, but being a big guy, obviously, like you joked about, I could do a suicide dive, and anybody would tell you, you don't have to do that, right? right yeah. You know? And... Uh, and so do you ever get um, frustrated at all by the fact that you're kind of – just by your size, you're a little limited in the ring? You know what I mean? Like as oh, far yeah. as – because it's like, it's like I just sit there and I go, okay, so it doesn't make any sense for me to sell for some guy who's five foot six. You yeah. know what I mean? But at the same time, like I'd love to have just a, you know, a good old-fashioned Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, you know, technically sound match. <clears throat> but the thing is, is it's six foot seven, you know, like I'm not going to have that match really. You know, right. do you ever feel the same way? Well, I think sometimes you, you want to do those moves and stuff like that. But I think in many cases, I think your storytelling could get you into that situation where you go, man, these guys just had a, a 20 minute match. And um, it was believable to me that this, uh, this, you know, five, seven guy could beat the seven footer, you know, um, if you're able to tell that story, like for me, it's always like about this guy's not going to pick me up and do anything like that, but I might get overconfident and I might try to do something where, uh, I put myself in danger. Um, mm. you know, the guy moves out of the way, you take the post or, um, you, uh, take too much time dropping an elbow or something. The guy moves out of the way and somehow the momentum turns. Um, so I remember watching, um, I know I want to say it was like Matt Stryker and JR Kratos at, uh, mm. at APW. And, mm. and I remember just like the before, you know, obviously I'm at this point, you know, I got to be, over 10 years in, right? And and I'm listening, I, I go to this Matt Stryker um, clinic just to mm -hmm. listen to him talk. And he's talking about how somebody doesn't have to give you a bunch of moves, right? You could just go, um, you know, I slam you, I go to drop an elbow, you roll one revolution away from me. So I miss that elbow, but it doesn't affect me that much. I kind of just shake it off a little bit, and I go to hit you with something else. Miss a leg drop because you roll one more revolution away from me. 
and then you start selling up into the corner. So then I come running and you move out of the way. So basically I just took three bumps without you doing anything to me. Um, and that obviously uh, in your power meter, you know, mm-hmm. drains your power. So um, right. just telling that story, I'm, I'm, you know, listen to him say this in this seminar and then him and J.R. Kratos, they do that exact same thing that night. And it's just like the light bulb goes off and you're like, wow, like he was just talking about it. I couldn't really visualize it. And then they do it in the match. And you're like, man, that was awesome. Like, uh, you know, it's not like Matt Stryker's picking up Kratos. It's not like he's giving him moves or anything like that. He literally is just avoiding getting hit. Mm, so, yeah. So um, you start you start wrestling. How long did your training go before you had your first match? I think it was close to a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my first match, I actually tagged with Flacco uh, against Jarevko and then one of the other students that was uh, at our school. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, just like you have the, the history with Jarevko, he was, yeah. in, you know, he was the opponent of my first match as well. So um, <laughs> yeah. kind of interlinks all yeah. these different people. He's been around forever. And, you know, it's it's so interesting. He was the first guy I ever met in pro wrestling, uh, other than Ollie, who was training us. Right. And, and yeah, I mean, that guy, he's been he's been a lot of guys' first match. He's been a lot of – and he's been the guy who's gotten a lot of guys' opportunities uh, to, to kind of branch out, Trip being right. one of them. Right. You know? And so – so now, um, so you go for a year and, you know, you you basically became, in my mind, like the big man of the NorCal Reno area. Right. Um, so how long before you started getting just, I mean, were you, were you just kind of going along with the scum for a while and getting a lot of bookings or did you start, how quickly were you getting kind of trading on your own name? Um, I, I mean, I, I give kind of all the credit to like Ugly, right? Ugly brought us in the SPW. I, you know, that was like my first opportunity. So that's like, um, I don't know, for me, that's priceless. Like that's, that's a guy that I'll work for, for kind of, um, you know, whatever he feels is fair. Like I just, it's this, uh, this debt that I think I could never repay. So, um, and I was always like that. Like I, I really appreciated the story of like, the Dudley boys working for ECW, even mm-hmm. after they got signed with WWF. Um, mm-hmm. So that was always my mindset. Like I'm going to um, take care of these people that took care of me, kind of giving me opportunities when I first started getting my foot in the door and, um, you know, and then ugly got us to go to Portland wrestling. So they would fly us in there every month and uh, we would tape uh, four episodes of TV when we were there. So um, we always got treated really well there. So, I feel like that was kind of the got the ball rolling for me. And then um, Corey Dayton and I, in 2005, we went to uh, to OVW when it was um, the developmental territory for WWF. Um, and it's maybe an opportunity that I passed up that I should have taken advantage of because they were like, oh, well, you can skip over the beginner's class. You can jump right in the advanced class with Rip Rogers. And... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, after the fact, you look back and go, man, that was probably a a huge opportunity that I potentially, um, you know, missed because of probably just being nervous. Like, um, you know, we had, uh, we had two kids at the time and it was just like, we could have moved to Louisville, Kentucky and, um, and I could have, you know, I could have made a run at it. Right. So I would have been 30 at the time. So. It would have been an opportunity, you know, to, to go for it and, uh, and and kind of give it the best shot. But, um, you know, you look back and it's like maybe maybe a missed opportunity or or whatever. But then, well, uh, well I everything think, ha- yeah. everything happens everything happens for a reason, right? Oh, so, absolutely. so you know, I mean, I think about this all the time because my my story in wrestling is a little different in that. I started wrestling. So Ollie started a wrestling promotion, Oliver John, mm-hmm. uh, or started a wrestling training school with uh, Paul DeMarco. And this is 97, 98. And I get in there probably two or three months before it closes down. And so Justin Caton was there, who's the guy who runs Next Level. Derevko was there. Schizo started PCW, was there. 
I mean, a lot of promotions came out of that place. And so we, uh, so I just started training in my backyard. And then, you know, uh, at the beginning SPW, uh, before Ugly took the book, it was this guy named Rich Roby who found, who found Ugly. And, uh, and I was a part of that. <clears throat> but, you know, it's funny because I, I sometimes look back because I ended up going on a mission for my church. But interestingly, right before that, I had talked to going, talked to uh, off of the Wild Samoan who ran the Wild Samoan Training Center about going out to Pennsylvania and training there. <clears throat> and the idea they had was six months, we give you one match. The guys, I think it was Dr. Co Tom was the guy who was kind of the, the one that was the guy who was choosing everybody back then. He said, he comes out all the time. We'll get you a job in security. But I was like, I got to go on this mission. And, you know, I think back and I go, you know, could I have made a run at that? Maybe I could have. And maybe I would have become a WWE superstar and I'd have been touring the world. But I'd also be pretty jacked up in my, like, the injuries, right? And I wouldn't have been around for my kids. You know, right. you got five you got five girls. Yep. You'd have been, you'd been on the road 200 days a year, you know? Right. So. I mean, I look at a lot of opportunities like that that I passed over, I think. Like, I went to... Um, you know, like a uh, TNA tryout and, um, you know, so we went to Universal Studios in Florida um, and I thought that went really well. And it was one of those things where I almost felt like they were testing me. Like uh, I was like, hey, should I come back tomorrow for the live show? And they're like, no, Terry Taylor's like, no, we don't have anything for you. And then I fly home and then I'm watching it on TV and I'm like, son of a gun, man, there's a couple guys that weren't as good as me, but they're doing security on that show. I'm like, I could have been doing security on that show. And then mm -hmm. maybe you work your way in after that. So that's another opportunity. Then Virgil Flynn was going to Harley Races camp in Missouri. So he's like, you guys got to come, man. Uh, you guys got to do this. It's, it's great. Um, you know. You're going to learn a little different training style and things like that, right? So we go there 2007 and 2008, and 2008, I'm the guy that wins the opportunity uh, to go wrestle uh, at Pro Wrestling NOAA. Mm, um, that's huge. As they're setting it up, they're like, oh, well, we want you to be there the end of September um, in 2009, and, um, and my daughter's going to be born in October, and I'm like, I just, I can't miss, uh, I can't risk missing the, the birth of my child. So, uh, I passed on that as well, you know? So it's just, mm. you think it's like all these things that are like over and over. Um, yeah. and then Adam and I got, to, to go to FCW for, uh, an invitation only tryout camp. Um, and that's when Jinder Mahal got signed. Mm. Uh, so I just thought like another opportunity, um, you know, to, to kind of get your foot in the door and work some security stuff, extra stuff with WWE. And, um, you know, it was always the, uh, you're too big, you need to lean out. And then I go back leaner and they're like, oh, you got to put on some size. And it was just <laughs> always this, you know, it's not the way you are right now. You have to be something different. So, mm -hmm. um, so just things like that. And then, you know, I think the last thing for me was uh, the tough enough that AJ Kirsch was on was I went there and I made the uh, the final whatever 26 mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and then got that got eliminated. So for me, that was like, OK, uh, at that point, um, I kind of was, I think, at peace with like this probably isn't going to happen for me, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so. I don't know. I just try to, my whole thing now is just like trying to give back and uh, try to try to do what I can as far as sharing the knowledge that I've gained over the last 20 years. Well, you know, it's interesting about that. I was just having this conversation. I was at a, I was teaching a class at church and there came up a topic about people being afraid of failure. And I kind of told them, I go, hey, listen, you know, let, let's talk about this failure idea. Because it was like, you know, I thought when I was 17, 18 years old, I thought I was for sure going to become a WWE superstar. I was going to main event WrestleMania. I was going to tour the world, right? And be rich. 
And I was like, and that didn't happen. You know, I didn't make the WWE do any of that stuff. Uh, but you know what? I did a lot of really cool things in wrestling. It's like, I, you know, I got to work with Impact. I got to work with New Japan. I got to do MTV2 with Lucha Libre USA. I got to meet some of the my, my idols in wrestling. I mean, when we did Impact, I mean, I'm hanging out. You know, Bubba Ray Dudley's talking to my son who's playing on my phone. I mean, <clears throat> I got to do all of this cool stuff. So was it would you consider it a failure because I didn't make the WWE? I mean, yeah, you could probably look at it that way, but man, I've had a colorful life that of experiences that I don't know what my life would look like if I didn't, I would have felt it was, I would have felt more regret never trying than I do for not making it to the WWE. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and I know, so, so tell me like what, you know, you, you were in there with Brian and was Mustafa still training over there when you were there? Yep. Okay. So you and I know you and the scum, Adam and, and Luster and Choopy, Corey Dayton, Malachi, you guys were all just like super tight. I mean, I, I never saw any of you without the others, really, or some combination of you. Tell me what some of those guys mean to your career. Oh, it was just like, um, you know, I feel like, I built that bond with like Adam and Lester specifically, um, like kind of right off the bat. It was, um, I know Lester would tell the story about when Brian was telling him that I was going to come and start training. He's like, Oh, we've got the seven footer coming in. And he's like, my expectations was you were going to be seven feet tall. You were going to be 200 pounds. You were just going to be goofy as all hell. And, um, you know, and then when I came in, obviously, um, I was probably, maybe, I don't know, 265, let's say. Um, so sizable guy, uh, mobile, athletic, um, you know, so we're like, all right, all right, so we can probably do something with this guy. This guy's going to be all right for us to, to uh, you know, go on the road and things like that. So I was always always the guy that would drive. So, um, you know, and, and I always really just kind of um, listened to what Mustafa said, and that's, uh, you've got two ears and one mouth, so, you know, uh, listen twice as much as you talk. So, um, so many stories, like, just on the road with Mustafa specifically, like, just probably not saying a word, literally just listening to stories that he's telling about, um, you know, being in the Carolinas and uh, ECW stuff and with Cornette and just all these different stories that at the time when you're listening you have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. Nothing makes any sense. And then throughout your career, you will see things and you'll be like, oh, that's what he was talking about. You know, mm -hmm. so many like aha moments throughout all that. And um, just, you know, kind of getting that, uh, the mindset of, um, you know, we always thought we were better than everybody else, right? We thought we were the best trained. Um, you know, we always thought like, We'll go to SPW, and now everyone has to raise their game. You know, ugly was a big thing. Like, uh, I'm going to bring in these guys, and you know, if you're not uh, going to keep up, then you probably should should get out. Um, so I think it was a a way to weed out some guys that maybe uh, shouldn't be there, but were you know maybe filling space at the time. So um, so I don't know. It, it always feels good when someone tells you, you know, obviously pads your ego. Um, and someone says, Hey, you're raising the bar for the rest of our company. So, um, but yeah, just, just traveling with those guys, man. It just, you think about how many years, how many miles we travel, travel together. We used to, um, work for Rikishi and Gangrel's promotion in, uh, in LA. So we used to travel me, Chupi, Adam Luster, uh, Malachi and Drake Nelson, like, we were the only team that they had that was legitimately all from the same city. So, um, and I think like when you watch things like that, you see like, okay, well, obviously these guys know what the other's thinking, kind of know where to be. Um, they just click. So it was always pretty, pretty special, like having matches like that. Yeah. Do you, um, uh, is there anybody else outside of that group that you really enjoyed working with? Uh, I mean, 
getting an opportunity to work with Oliver John, I think, is always cool. Uh, Prime Time and I, I think, always had really good matches. Rick Luxury, I thought was awesome. Um, I got to work Brian Cage a couple times, always like top notch. Um, I've worked Frost a ton of times, ugly a ton of times. Like, um, you know, I mean, I like, I don't know, I like, I like working with all those guys and then just, you know, sprinkling those, those opportunities to work with Gangrel and Rikishi, um, you know, and some of the other stars that you see, like, um, maybe making their, uh, their way back from being, uh, in the big time. Uh, mm-hmm. those were always like good opportunities, but I always thought like those things were always kind of fueled by the popularity of Adam and Luster. You know, I, mm-hmm. I always felt like I was riding their coattails, um, you know, cause it was, they're going to be in a big time match and maybe it's going to be a six man. So, Hey, we need somebody else and, and, and you're the guy. So, um, uh, I always felt like, you know, blessed to have those opportunities and, you know, those are, it's, it's my favorite tag team to watch is, is those guys. Um, so it's just, uh, obviously it has to do with the friendship of just wanting to see your buddy succeed and just also knowing how much work went into getting where they got. Um, and I don't know, I always thought that, that they got passed up. Like I always thought they were so much better than they got credit for and they should have had more opportunities, but just, uh, they just really were. Happening. They really were. I mean, as a guy who's promoted wrestling shows and, and knows what, you know, there's some guys that just, they have it, you know what I mean? Whatever it is. And that tag team together. I, I mean, I remember the first time I met Adam, you know, it was before he had any tattoos. He was right. still doing the trendsetter thing, you know, and he was right at the beginning of his career. I did a show. I, my first show I ever ran, I was 21 years old. It was 2003, I think. Probably 2000. It might have been 22. So it's 20, 2003. I put on a show. And Adam and um, Corey and Chupi showed up. Right. And I didn't, ha- I didn't have any. I, I told them, I was like, look, I don't have any money to pay you to do the show. Uh, or wrestle the show. But if you want to do a promo... I'll throw you, you know, I'll throw you some some gas money. You could do a promo and I'll get you on the next show. And Adam and Corey did a thing uh, together. And then Derevko and Chupi were going to do a thing. We were going to build to a tag match between the four of them. And uh, I could tell from the from the promo that Adam, that they were different. They were a step above. Even at that point, they were a step above all the other guys. And then watching them work. And so so when him and Luster got together, I mean, man, like they're I, I can't think of a tag team in this area that looked and worked like superstars like they did. You know what I mean? It's just it's right. it's it's surprising to me that WWE never picked them up. Right. I mean, because they I I never saw a show they didn't get over. Right, exactly. <laughs> so um now, so what's next for your wrestling career? Where are you at now? What are you wanting to do? Because I've seen you work. You're still working. You can still go. Yeah, I know. But it's like I, I remember years ago that I'm like, man, I think I got to hang it up because you always have that that self-doubt where you're like, I, I'm i holding people back. And that's always like, it, I feel like it's so cliche. Like you hear like, I don't want to be a parody of myself or whatever like that. But um I, I truly just don't want to hold people back. Like I feel like if I can bring something to the show, then uh, then I'm more than willing to do that. And and I think at this point, it's really not about like what kind of push I could get. It's more about like how can I help uh, younger guys um, maybe get of the the same mindset as me. So um, you know, I, I put something on on Facebook the other day because it was just it was eating me because the choking in front of the referee, right? It's, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's the way that people are trained or, or what, but it's like I was watching a match and it was like a guy is choking the person in front of the referee and the referee's counting and the guy goes, I've got till five. And it's like, well, no, you don't. You, uh, you're not allowed to cheat. You know, mm-hmm. that's why people do it behind the ref's back. That's why there's a distraction whatever but um you know i 
there's that misconception. Like I don't I don't know where that that came from. Where you think that you're allowed to cheat for five seconds. Um, you know when when in reality, my view is um, the referee is giving you a warning. Like they're counting and they're like, if you do that again, I'm going to disqualify you. So quick story about that. Me, um, I want to say me, Adam Luster, um, Thatcher. We went to um, like an evaluation at OVW. Um, this was, I don't think they had anything to do with developmental, but for some reason that day, um, uh, Johnny Ace was there, uh, Mark Henry, um, Gail Kim, they were all there just like watching. And let's say there's 30 people there and they go, okay, everyone's going to be involved in a match. Um, there's people there trying to get jobs as referees. So there's a six man tag. Um, the first two guys are tussling around. The guy pushes them into the corner, starts choking him. The referee starts counting, says, if you do that again, I'm going to disqualify you. And it was like, shoot him, buckle the buckle to the other open corner, something, something choking him again, and the referee's like, ring the bell. So the referee's trying to trying to say, hey, I'm the authority figure. He's trying to get a job. He's trying to prove to WWE, like, hey, I'm the authority figure. I'm going to disqualify someone if they're cheating because that's what you would do in WWE in theory, right? Mm -hmm. um, so four of these guys in this six-man tag do not get to wrestle a match. Because mm -hmm. that happened. And you can think, well, oh, so well, these guys should be all pissed off or whatever. But it's like, then you got to look at the referee. It's like, well, do I get buried because these guys aren't listening to the rules of the, um, you know, the authority figure in this match? Um, you know, so it's it's one of those things. And I think you have that. The referees are like, well, it's not the finish of the match. Mm -hmm. so I can't disqualify you. Um, but at the same time, you just make the referee look, you know, um, terrible. You know, you, you make yeah. them look like they don't have any authority. Um, you know, and then you have the fans that are like, hey, why aren't you disqualifying that guy? He's cheating right in front of you. Right. Um, and it was just one of those things. It was just like, um, it just really irritated me. Mm, yeah. Can you tell me what is the... Uh... Have you been, have you ever been injured in the ring, and what was the worst one you had? Uh, I actually have never been injured in the ring. Um, hmm. I could say maybe I was injured outside of the ring. I remember that there used to be that promotion called Brawl that hmm. all the Antioch guys were running, um, and I was wrestling Adam, and he cross bodied me from the top rope to the outside. But Adam was notorious for when he came out to the ring to be spitting water, right? It was mm. his uh, his heel persona. He was going to mm. spit water up in the air, but strategically over fans that were uh, he didn't appreciate. So, <laughs> so there was water on the floor, and I caught him, and I fell down. So I didn't realize what was going on, but, um, you know, we finished that match, and then we got right in the car, and we drove – to Portland, Oregon for the Portland wrestling tapings. And I just remember being like, my knee feels kind of sore. It was like um, swollen and stuff, but I was like, oh, I'm gonna just get like the those icy hot patches or whatever. So ice my knee, you know, on this trip from Sacramento or wherever, Bay Area, all the way up to Portland, Oregon. Um, and then when we get home that Monday, I'd go to the doctor and I'd say, man, I think I messed up my knee. Uh, and they're like, oh, well, uh, it feels too stable for anything to be wrong. So I'm like, all right. So obviously you guys are the mental, medical professionals. Um, you know, I'll just do the rest, ice, you know, compression, elevate, right? So I'll, I'll do the, the, the methods that I learned treating injuries. So, um, so I continue to wrestle and lift weights and uh, do all the normal stuff for probably close to a year. And then it's just like my knee is like clicking and popping and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I go back in and just go, hey, I don't know what's going on, but it just it doesn't feel right. Um, so they do some tests. 
They say, man, it, it feels stable, doesn't look like there's anything going on, nothing showed up on the MRI, but what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll do a scope. Um, mm. If there's any scar tissue, we'll clean it up. Um, if there's something really wrong, then we'll fix it. Um, so they go in there and they show me the video of inside my knee afterwards, but there was no ACL at all. So they had to huh. do like the cadaver graph and uh, put a put an ACL into my knee. So um, yeah, so that was probably the only injury that I can think of. Like I've never been hurt by someone, um, and you know, knock on wood, I've never hurt anyone either. So uh, yeah, that's a that's a big claim. I mean, as a big guy like you said that you never hurt anybody, that's that's a good claim. Right. Is there any is there anybody that's kind of the up and comers now that you would love to work with? Um, you know what? So we had Midas Creed on mm. on our show this Saturday. I think that guy definitely talented. Um, there's I think there's a couple guys from PCW. I know. Um, uh, I want to say it's Rayshon Prince. Mm. Um, I think it's super talented as well. So. There's definitely some guys. I mean, I'm I'm not as as on the scene for sure as I used to be, um, yeah. you know. But I definitely like seeing these guys come in. And um, I went to PCW when they did this last Young Lions Cup to kind of like help agent matches. And um, you know, you see Illumide and Jason and Xavier and some of these guys, and um, you know, just what you want to see. Like I remember seeing Illumide at. Uh, and SPW, we had a, we had some guys fly in here from from Wisconsin. So, um, so we had a show on the Saturday, and then SPW had their show on the Sunday, our Halloween show. So I was like, oh well, I'll just take you guys there. Uh, we'll get on that show, and um, it was just one of those things. Like I had never met this guy Illuminate, but just looking at him physically, you're like, that dude looks like a wrestler, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in shape athletic looks like he's strong and um so you know just watching him in that young lions cup i thought was was pretty good so um there's some guys like that but i mean i feel like there's not like a um that um the wish list for me like oh man i gotta work this guy before it's all done Um, yeah you know like i feel like i've had really good matches like with adam or if i work luster obviously just based off of um the familiarity really um, mm-hmm. kind of knowing what they do and um, I don't know, just things like that. I just worked with the midnight heat this last weekend. And mm-hmm. Those guys are fantastic. Um, so just, I don't know. I think there's a lot of, a lot of good, good talent out there. Um, you just hope that you have, uh, I know like ugly used to do like a, um, like a critiques or whatever like that. Um, you know, and you just hope like some of those guys would would go and and talk to an ugly or a prime time or luxury Adam Luster, those guys, and just kind of go, hey, would you mind watching my match? And hopefully take the critique and take it seriously and try to make those changes. You know, I think that's really the mark of those those guys that really want to get better is when they're gonna say, hey, can you watch my match? And you say, absolutely, I'll watch it. And here's my realistic critiques. And they go, thank you. And the next time you watch them wrestle, they've changed those things. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've been getting back into it and kind of going to shows and stuff. I've seen a couple of guys that are new that I just, I mean, Trip Rogers is somebody who just kind of, I think he has it. You know what I mean? He just, he kind of get it, gets it with that onesie gimmick he's got going on and stuff like that. And then there's this guy, I don't, I don't know who he is. I met him, um, this uh the, this last show uh, JMM I don't know what that stands for, but right. that guy is crazy charisma. I mean knows how to work a crowd. You know right. what I mean? Just uh, watching his match, I'm like, man, this guy, you know he, you know I, I like he comes into the he comes in and I just go okay, so just another you know he's another indie guy or whatever. And then but then he goes out there and I go oh he just transformed into like a uh, just a, a great heel bad guy just really does does a great job so there's a lot of those guys out there and of course you know the too fresh i really like think those guys just right. know what they're doing you know yeah. and so man so uh so now 
you know, we've talked about your wrestling. We talked about basketball. Now you're teaching. Do you feel like, do you have the same passion for teaching? I mean, it's been one day, right? But do you feel oh, like yeah. this is. I, I did. I substitute taught at this school since January. So um, I just, I really like the vibe where I'm at. So, um, so yeah, I, I think I'm really going to enjoy it. I'm really trying to click with the kids and things like that and try to um, I just had a coaching meeting today for coaching girls basketball. So, um, you know, I think I'm trying to take the things that I learned playing basketball. I've, I've always coached over the last 20 years or so, um, high school or, uh, or just doing individual workouts, things like that. Just trying to really, I felt like this community here treated me so well when I played here that that's kind of the ultimate goal is, uh, is to give back. Um, I've been trying to help these guys, um, get recruited to play in college. Um, so it's, it's very, very much a passion of mine really to, to help that, uh, that stuff happen. There's just not, um, a whole lot of coaches that come to Northern Nevada, unfortunately, because it's far from a hotbed for, um, for recruiting. I'd like to change mm. or help change that, you know, make it where, um, coaches go, Oh, this person came out of Northern Nevada. Uh, and so did this person and so did this person, maybe I need to start sending some, uh, some recruiting that way or, uh, get in contact with some coaches over here. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that's going to happen. And, and on a side note, you talk about JMM and that's a guy that we trained. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did he train out with you guys? Nice. Yeah. Yeah, um, he's he's good, man. He's yeah. he knows what he's doing. You know, another one I think he trained with you was a uh, Jaya Jaya. Yeah. So, and so that's the ultimate example of the guy that just wants to make it right. So, he trained with us, um, got to a certain point, and then the school closed down here. So his whole thing was, well, I want to still train. Where can I go um, that I can train and uh, I would hope that you would agree that um, you're not going to get much better than being with Sorrow uh, oh, yeah. as far as training. And um, ironically, we talk about just, just learning in general and people that will take advice or say, hey, will you watch my match? Um, I, I took some advice from Vinny, which I wasn't, he wasn't even talking to me, but he was talking to Frost about um, how – when you throw something that you're going to miss, it has to look the same as when you throw something when you're going to hit it. Um, you know, and it just like resonated with me, like, okay, well, um, and, and a perfect example that I can use is like, if you talk about samurai throwing a back elbow um, to kind of get into the shot a little bit, elbow up, mm -hmm. hand here, just in case you want to whip reverse, mm -hmm. the elbow, whip reverse the guy. Mm. But it doesn't matter. If he hits the back elbow, the hand is still there. So yeah. um those are the type of things that um that I think, you know, not telegraphing something where you don't throw the over the top clothesline, you throw like straight across regardless if the guy's gonna duck or not. So um but that was like that's what the, yeah. within the last year that I heard that from Vinny. And I'm like, wow, dude, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm going to incorporate that and I'm going to pass that on to anyone who will listen. Yeah. Man. So, real quick before, you know, we, I, I appreciate you giving me this time. Tell me, you know, give me a little bit more. What are you, this is going to be kind of a loaded question, but tell me what your family, your wife, your kids, what that means to you, what they mean to you. Oh, it's, it's everything. So, uh, when I always think like, you ask somebody, uh, tell me about yourself or who are you? For me, it's always, um, you know, husband of 22 years, father of five daughters. You know, that's that's the, the top of the list before mm -hmm. anything else, before uh, professional wrestler, pro basketball player, um, whatever the job that I'm doing at the time, you know, um, that's the, that's the top of the list. That's, that's the number one priority. So, um, you know, unfortunately I think it's, that kind of shows your priorities in life. You know, if, if the yeah. first thing you say is, uh, you know, I'm a shoe salesman, um, 
you know, maybe that's your passion and that's what you're focused on. Um, you know, but for me, my, uh, I live my life for my daughters and my wife, you know, that's like, um, I work, a, you know, I work a job for, um, not so I can buy stuff for myself so I can make sure to afford them the life that's, um, that I think they deserve. Yeah, man. Yeah. Have you, uh, have you had to run off a couple of boys? I'm sure you're a scary, uh, you're, you're a scary dad to, to have to meet. Well, so my wife has been a teacher for, this is her 21st year. So I've all, my girls have always gone through my wife's elementary school. So mm. every boy that knows my daughters also knows me because I'm very much a presence in uh, all school activities. You know, I'd be in my wife's classroom um, doing whatever, you know, just making my presence known. So a lot of times they'd be like, um, you know, oh, that's uh, such and such as dad right there, or mm-hmm. such and such as dad is uh, is that really big guy, the giant guy, or um, you might not, not be able to reach that, but such and such as dad can. Yes. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so yeah, I think um, the most people know who I am. You know, like I, I know my daughter was talking about. Oh, you know, I met this guy, and he says he knows you, and I'm like, sure he does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah involved in in a lot of things yeah man i my uh <clears throat> my daughters are younger than yours uh or at least your older ones they're 14 and 12 and it just feels like it was so funny overnight i just looked at my daughters and they got dressed up for something i don't remember what they were they both got dressed up and i look at them and i'm like when did you become young women right. and i was like i am going to kill anybody who comes near you you know what I mean? And, and I'm the same, I'm the same as you. Like I go to their school, they, they all, they go to K through 12 charter schools. So they've been at the same school, their whole school careers, mm-hmm. all four of them. And uh, so everybody knows who I am, you know, over there and stuff like that. But yeah, it's so different, man. I mean, with the boys, it's so different. And I don't, I don't know why I'm not as worried about my, like my son's got a girlfriend and she's really nice and he's brought her by the house and, you know, I know her family and all that. But there's something about boys coming near my girls that I'm just, it's a different deal. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, say that it's probably because you know the mindset of that age of boy because you were once there, you know? Uh, yeah. I know. I know. I try to tell them, though, you know, even my son, I try to explain to them how, how important, like, I, my, he, my son didn't listen to me. I told him, I'm like, you, you don't want to get into a relationship in high school it's it's such a time suck and it's so much drama you don't need in your life you know what i mean you think back i had a i had a high school high school you know crush sweetheart best friend whatever you want to call her and you know like i I guess i don't regret it because she was an important part of my my life and getting me where i am but at the same time it was a lot of drama that i really didn't need you know what I mean? Uh, and and I missed out on so many opportunities to like go and meet new people and, and, and stuff because I was so hung up on this one person. And that's really the time where you want to just have, have fun. Cause you're not going to end up with them anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I definitely well, let me the, uh, the have, uh, have fun being a kid, you know, like for me, it was, you know, I was all sports man until, um, so I was in college for sure. Um, had no, no interest in having a girlfriend. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to, to play basketball or, or, you know, baseball or just whatever sport we were playing as kids. Like, um, mm-hmm. you know, it was just like, those were my focuses, man. I, I want to be an athlete. Uh, I love playing sports. So that was always my focus. I didn't have time for the other stuff. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, I'm going to ask you the questions I ask uh, everybody. The first thing, what do you think is your number one success in life? Oh, my daughters for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's like my, my oldest daughter, uh, is going into her junior year of college. She's going to be a lawyer like herself. Oh, nice. Um, so, uh, we'll probably have to connect at some point for her to maybe get some insight from you. Absolutely. Uh, she's a, she's a Sac State, right? No, she's actually here at University of Nevada. So um, okay. I don't know. I know she talked about maybe going to law school. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly. But, yeah, so she we took a trip 
Uh, this is kind of funny because Ugly always says, oh, she's at Sac State, right? Because there was a show that I was telling them, like, hey, we're going to be at Sac State doing a visit. Because she mm -hmm. was getting recruited to, um, I think, uh, be a rower there for, mm -hmm. their, uh, for their crew or, or whatever rowing team, cement uh, canoes or whatever. So we went there, and the campus was beautiful, man. We had a great time. It is. On our way back, it probably took us eight hours to get home because there was like a canola oil spill on 80. So <laughs> we got stuck between two exits. So like nowhere to go. So, mm. um, but it didn't feel like it took very long because we were just talking about all the great things about that campus and how cool it would be to go there, how close it would be. But um, she ended up just deciding that she was going to go to UNR and, um, you know, kind of follow my wife and I both graduated from there. So, um, you know, local Man, and so so mega, legacy kid. And, and really what was, what's crazy. And, and, uh, you know, I, I can't be more happy, but it was, she was just like when our youngest daughter was born, she made a comment that we thought, Oh, she's just saying what we want to hear. And it was, I don't know if I want to go away to college because I don't want to miss, um, you know, my youngest sister growing up and we're like, hmm. Oh, you know, that's really nice of you to say, but that's really what the decision came down to. It's like, I want to be close to you guys so I can just come over and hang out with her whenever I want. So, yeah. Um, is is yeah. there a good, is there a good uh, pre-law advisor over there at UNR? Is she talking to a pre-law guy? Oh, you know, I am not sure, but I know that they do have, um, I want to say it's like, I know there's like a judicial college yeah. on campus, so I don't know if, exactly what the law program is, but um, yeah, because if she's if she's uh, if she's a junior, that means that this next summer is probably when she's going to want to start thinking about taking the LSAT. Oh, is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You you know you, you got I think you got my info, my number, yeah. and stuff. You can always have her just give me a call, sure, uh, and I and I'm happy to just kind of give her some info, you know, because. It's so hard to figure out where you want to go, what you want to do. You know, I actually took my LSAT at UNR. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I'm happy to, I do a lot of mentoring of law students, so you can totally, uh, I'll try to convince her not to do it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then if she wants to do it still, then I know she's going to be a good lawyer. So, um, no, but that, I always love that. Does she have an idea what she wants to do in the law or just wants to be a lawyer? Well, it's, it's kind of crazy because at first she went to a, uh, uh, like a technology high school where she was in the medical program. So when she graduated from uh, high school, she could have um, just went straight into being a paramedic. Like they have the ambulances here in town mm -hmm. called Runza. Mm -hmm. So she could have just went straight into that. Um, and then at some point she's like, you know, I think I want to be like a, a malpractice lawyer. You know, so mm, like, totally flip the script, right? Yeah. I want to go after bad doctors. Oh um, yeah. You know, so it's just uh so yeah, so I don't know exactly what, what happened, but um yeah, so she just decided um instead of going the medical route, she was gonna go um into that. So I don't know exactly what the goal is. Um sure. I'm not sure if she knows what the goal is at this point, but um sure. yeah. Yeah. Well, I would tell, I would also tell her, you know, I thought I was, I was going to be a prosecutor. I thought I was going to be prosecuting criminals uh -huh. and then I fell into personal injury and wrongful death. And this is perfect for me. Okay. And, uh, and so, you know, go in with an open mind, maybe you have an idea what you want to do, but you might fall into something you never even thought of. So yeah, I mean, just give her my info and I'd be happy to talk to her. So of course. now, um, so, so what is you, what would you say is your biggest failure in life and what did you learn from it? Um, I mean, I think like just as far as like, so like I said, my wife has been a teacher for 21 years, right? So she's been like that solid, you know, know what I want to do. And, and I feel like I've had like 40 jobs or something like that. Never <laughs> like um, stuck with something like, and so hopefully this is the career change that's going to be really good for me, you know, going into something that, uh, um, you know, that I really enjoy and something that I can do until retirement. That would be hopefully what's going to happen. But yeah, that's kind of like what I think is 
Um, you know, working for some companies that I think like potentially could have been a career and then just for one reason or another, mostly wrestling, I think, um, kind of going off track and going, oh, well, I want to take these bookings and that doesn't kind of uh, line up with this job. So I'll just let this job go, take these bookings, and then I'll go back and get something different. So um, mm -hmm. maybe something like that would be the maybe the downfall, just um, not uh, not having the, the concrete idea of what I want to do when I grow up. And maybe I don't have that yet either. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I mean, look, there's no time limit on this stuff. You know what I mean? You, I, I talk, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than you, but I was telling one of my law clerks who just left, she was saying something along the lines of, oh, man, you know, I'm not going to be done with law school till school till 28. I was like, I didn't graduate law school till 31, you know, and here I am now. And it's been, you know, 11 years. I can't believe it's been that long. But I mean, here I am 11 years later and I've had a great career. I've done way better than I ever thought I could do. I, you know, I've gotten all the awards and done all the stuff. And I was like, so it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter when you start. If you find your passion, you can find it at 40, 50, 60 right. and, you know, and have a very fulfilled life. So there's no time limit on that stuff. Of course. Yeah. So last question I ask everybody, and that is, you know, at some point later on down the road, you're going to pass away and there's going to be a funeral and there's going to be a eulogy. What do you hope the one thing would be that someone would say in your eulogy? Uh, I would hope it would be a great father, you know, like, um, I feel like a lot of people kind of give that, uh, give me that compliment and I'm always very hesitant, um, to take that compliment. Like, obviously I do the best that I can, but you, uh, obviously, you know, like there's, there's no manual, right? You're just doing what you think is the right thing to do. And, um, you know, sometimes you look back and you just like, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I did the right thing there or, um, you know, maybe something gets questioned and you're just like, you know, uh, I thought that was the best decision at the time. And for us, sometimes like with our older two girls, like, um, you know, my wife was raised Catholic. Right. So when we met, we started going to uh, her church and, um, you know, I kind of we just got involved with that and. Um, and we thought that was the right path, right? We're going to uh, have our kids go to, um, you know, Catholic, um, you know, learning things, um, you know, confirmation, all these, all these things that we feel like is going to help um, put their life down the right path. And then you kind of get like, well, why'd you force us to do that? And it's just like... <laughs> You know, that's that's what we thought was going to be a good foundation. Uh, now that you're an adult, you know, you choose your path. Um, yeah. We we try to point you in the right direction. Um, you know, our girls have never been in trouble. Um, always been great students. Um, so, as much as sometimes you think like oh you're doing the best thing, then it's those things sometimes where you go, maybe I didn't do a very good job. Um, you know, and then you have to kind of just look at yourself in the mirror and just go, "Hey, like this is what I I thought was the best." Um, Wait, well, listen, you just you just got through saying it. None of your kids have been in trouble. They're all good kids. Right. I, I'd say that's a win. You oh, know what I mean? Yeah, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. But it's just it's one of those things where um, you know maybe you start thinking it's not appreciated or whatever. But I felt the same when I was a. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, I thought my parents were stupid and they didn't know what they're talking about. And my dad would always tell me, when you grow up, when you get older, I'm going to continue to get smarter, you know, and that has nothing to do with his knowledge growing. It'll have something to do with my knowledge growing and going, hey, well, my dad said that I thought he was full of shit. But 20 years later, now I know that he was right when he yeah. told me this, but I was yeah. rebelling or you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're old. Same thing with wrestling, right? You're like, Oh, my mindset, maybe on how a match goes together. Maybe people say, Oh, you're out of touch or whatever. And you hear that about a lot of old school guys and, um, mm -hmm. you know, but then 
at some point you get old and you go, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be taking all these crazy risks. <laughs> yeah, right. Stuff, right? So, yeah. yeah, I love going into ra- into matches and you know I've worked for uh, ACW and you know Durant goes the Booker and he's like, I don't want you to take a bump and I'm like, great. <laughs> you I know, <laughs> it was like yeah. great. Sounds awesome. <laughs> so no, but you know you say about 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 parenthood and kids. You know, and also growing up, you know, my dad, I'm I'm at the age my dad was when he was going through like the thick of his stuff, you know, like his demon stuff and all that. And I have a lot of resentment for a lot of years about that stuff. But the thing is, is that now that I'm his age, I kind of have a different understanding of like the pressure he was under and what he was dealing with, with kids and trying to provide and do all these things without any, I mean, he didn't have any role model at all for how to do it. And you know, I think our kids are the same way. Like I, there are, I don't know how many days I just want to wring one of their necks for just, you know, being so, I mean, yeah, I think my favorite thing to say to my kids is that's like, I don't understand how someone who I know is so smart can be so stupid. You know what I mean? Like you just, do, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, but they'll figure it out. And, you know, you're doing, you're doing exactly what, I mean, you know, you, you're learning. I, I said this to my son, when he turned 13, we started having some problems. We were just crack, you know, we were just really, really button heads. And I finally told him, I go, Hey, listen, man, here's the deal. Like you've never been a teenager before and I've never parented a teenager before. So I'm going to try to cut you a little slack. You try to cut me a little slack. We're trying to figure this out together. And that's really all it is. Like there, you said, there's no rule book for this stuff. <laughs> you know, we're all trying to just figure it out and do not, you know, not have to pay for therapy for them when they're older. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so, well, listen, man, it's been great listening to you and talking to you and getting to know you a little bit better. We've known each other for, I mean, 15 years probably. And I've never had a chance to, to even really have a conversation like this with you just because we're always, we we're always, either I was promoting a show and running around so busy or you were trying to figure out what match you were going to do and all these things. So it's been really great to to get to know you uh, and get to know your mindset. And, uh, you know, you're, you're just, a, I've always thought you were just a great guy. So I'm really glad that, you know, we were able to do this. So awesome, man. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, man. It's a, it's one of those things like, uh, <laughs> listening to all these other people. And I was like, man, I think, um, you know, what well, same thing, like getting to know you as well. I think it's, it's a really cool opportunity. And, um, I'm glad that you're, uh, you know, putting your time and effort into doing something like this where, um, you know, we can learn more about other people that we know and uh, their story as well. So I think it's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I appreciate it. Uh, and we'll, we'll have to have you back. You know, I'm going to start a uh, a top seven list. Uh, every Like I was thinking about doing once a month where we just do top seven on some topic. And maybe we'll do basketball or something like that. And just the top seven basketball players from the 80s and 90s or something. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you back on. So. For those who have been listening, I appreciate you listening. Subscribe. we got a bunch of other stuff coming on. I'm, I'm working on some really interesting ones. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, I think I have a sex worker that's going to come on. So that'll be fun to hear. I think a Mormon talking to a sex worker will be a, will be a fun listen. And uh, and then, I've got, of course, i got more wrestlers. i got more more religious stuff. i got more mental health people. we got all sorts of stuff. So appreciate everybody. And thanks. Uh, thank you, Paul, Steve, whatever you want to call you. You're just a good you're just a good dude. So I appreciate you coming on. All right, man. I appreciate it.